Hello, and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous Noon Conferences by creating a free MRI Online account. You can also sign up for a free trial of our premium membership to get access to hundreds of case-based microlearning courses across all key radiology subspecialties. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. David Usum for a spine imaging board review, an interactive and rapid review of as many cases as possible. This is a sneak peek into the upcoming neuro quiz bank of 100 brain, 100 spine, and 100 head and neck cases that will be offered for the purposes of board review for the diagnostic radiology certification and neuroradiology subspecialty certification exam. Sign up to be the first to know when it launches using the link provided in the chat. Dr. Yusum is a neuroradiologist and professor of radiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's the author of 350 scientific papers and several popular books in radiology, and is the series editor of the Case Review series. He served as the president of the American Society of Neuroradiology and was awarded the Outstanding Educator, Educator Award from RSNA. We are grateful for Dr. Yusum and his support of MRI Online and for serving as our neuroimaging subspecialty advisor. At the end of the lecture, please join Dr. Yusum in a Q&A session. We'll try to address as many questions as you have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit those questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. And with that, we're ready to begin today's board review. Dr. Yusum, please take it from here. Thank you very much. Well, my goal today is to get through a lot of cases, as many cases as possible, and poll the audience for their answers and make it interactive and fun if we can. So we're going to take off here with spine case review. These are all new cases that I just loaded up recently. And they are in addition to the 100 spine case review cases that will be available for board review. So let's uh, dive right in and see what we got. All right, here is case number 101. Again, the first 100 are gonna be offered through MRI online. Um, I'm letting you see a T2 weighted image, a post gadolinium enhanced axial scan, and then a sagittal T2 stir image. Case 101. And uh, I'm going to start the polling. So what do you think is the best diagnosis for this case? Is this a Pancos tumor, a neurofibroma, a schwannoma, a lymph node, or a synovial cell sarcoma? So those are your choices, one through five. Number one, Pancos tumor. Number two, neurofibroma. Number three, schwannoma. Number four, lymph node. And number five, synovial cell sarcoma. So we've, uh, once I hit 100 uh, answers, I'll uh, stop the polling so you can see what people have said. So you got to be fast uh, in your answering. Uh, the majority of people put in choice number three, but the correct answer was by 39 people, answer number two. So this is an example of a patient who had a neurofibroma and you should know that this is a lesion that is associated with the brachial plexus. This is the anterior scaling muscle anterior to the lesion, posterior middle scaling muscle behind it. And within brachial plexus lesions, neurofibromas outnumber schwannomas. Most of the time, schwannomas are much more common than neurofibromas. And this does have what we call the um, target sign of lower signal intensity centrally with periphery that is uh, brighter. So the distinction between schwannomas and neurofibromas is very hard to make on imaging. And as you know, we rely on a few of these findings, including the target sign, as well as if there is central enhancement, it's more likely to represent a neurofibroma. If it's a cystic lesion, more likely to be a schwannoma. You have the fascicular sign, which is small little ring-like structures within the lesion. That's more likely to be a schwannoma. But most importantly, we see neurofibromas in the setting of neurofibromatosis type 1. A good follow-up question for the boards asks you, what are the seven major criteria of neurofibromatosis type 1? You should know these. Six or more cafe au lait spots, axillary freckling, lish nodules, optic pathway glioma, 
a plexiform neurofibroma family history of neurofibroma and a skeletal dysplasia. So those are the seven major criteria of neurofibroma. Again, cafe au lait spots, axillary freckling, Lish nodules, optic pathway glioma, skeletal dysplasia, family history of a family member with it and plexiform neurofibroma or two or more neurofibromas. So let's move on from this case. Correct answer was neurofibroma. I'm going to stop sharing and get ready to relaunch my poll. So here we have a T1 weighted, T2 weighted, post gadolinium enhanced T1 weighted and axial. This is actually a T2 weighted image looking at the lesion at L45. So case 102, what do you think this is going to be? What's the best diagnosis here? Is this a protrusion, an extrusion, a sequestrated disc? an epidural hematoma, or does this represent lymphoma? So go ahead and start answering the questions. Would you say that this is most likely a protrusion, extrusion, sequestration, sequestrated disc, epidural hematoma, or number five, lymphoma? So we're polling for those options behind the L5 vertebra. So we've got our 100 answers, and the most common answer is sequestrated disc, and that is indeed the correct answer. By virtue of this lesion, this piece of disc, no longer communicating with the parent disc, and that's probably most obvious on the post-GAD scan. Sequestrated discs, these disc fragments, often have a little bit of a peripheral enhancement, and you can see that that peripheral enhancement separates it from the parent disc, identifying this as a sequestration. So in the North American Spine Society, American Society of Neuroradiology and American Society of Spine Radiology, we have agreed to the nomenclature of protrusion for that lesion that has a wider base than its peripheral per portion, the extrusion, which kind of looks like the mushroom cloud with a narrow base and a more wide peripheral portion, and then a specific type of extrusion where the disc is no longer communicating with the parent disc, and that is the sequestration or sequestrated disc. The importance of this is that if you were to consider chemonucleolysis to, to dissolve the disc, that would not work with the sequestrated disc because it no longer communicates with the disc space uh, at the, in this case, the L45 level. So the correct answer here, sequestrated disc. Let's move on to case 103. Oh, I forgot to share the results. Uh, stop sharing. Let's relaunch. Okay, case 103, we have the CT scan and the MR scan. This is a STIR image, and this is a post-gadolinium T1-weighted image. Case 103. The question here is, the patient has prostate cancer. What's the most likely diagnosis of this lesion? Is it myeloma? Is it a metastasis from a second primary? Is it more likely to be a chordoma? a giant cell tumor, or is this a prostate metastasis? Again, our choices in a patient who has prostate cancer, is this going to be more likely myeloma, a second primary, not prostate metastasis, chordoma, giant cell tumor, or prostate metastasis? So the uh, audience is feverishly putting in answers. We'll end the poll, and this time I actually will share the results with you. And it's kind of split here. And appropriately so, but the most frequent answer was choice number five, which is actually the correct answer. And this was biopsy proven prostate cancer. Why is this uh, a difficult case? Because it's a lytic lesion, which is a little bit unusual. And I have some numbers for you for lytic lesions. From the standpoint of lytic lesions, 56% of breast cancer metastases are lytic, 14% of prostate cancer metastases are lytic, 64% of lung cancer metastases are lytic, and 91%, 91% of renal cell carcinomas uh, metastases are lytic. When we shift to blastic metastases, 20% of breast metastases are, are blastic, 62% of prostate cancer metastases are plastic, 33% lung, and only 7% renal cell carcinoma. So if you had to say of what primaries has the highest rate of a lytic 
lesion, it would be renal cell carcinoma. And the same thing asked about um, primary tumors with blastic, it would be the prostate cancer, but this ended up being a prostate cancer metastasis. Let's move on to case 104. Let me stop sharing, relaunch my poll. This is fun. Okay. Case 104. So um, here we have the axial CT scan. We have a sagittal reconstruction from the axial CT scan. And uh, although this might be a crazy orientation, this is actually the coronal reconstruction through the uh, posterior elements here. So axial, sagittal, and the coronal reconstruction. So what is the best diagnosis for this lesion? Would you call this a hemangioma, a giant cell tumor, a chondroid neoplasm? Is this just DJD, degenerative uh, disease uh, related to the ligamentum flavum or none of the above? So our choices here are number one, hemangioma, two, giant cell tumor, three, chondroid neoplasm, four, DJD, or none of the above. So our uh, poll is, we hit our 100 people. And um, number three, which is chondroid neoplasm, was the most common uh, answer. Uh, this turned out to be biopsy-proof hemangioma. So uh, only 16% of you got that one right. But why is it hemangioma? This, this bubbly bone lesion could be from uh, a number of these options. The hemangioma, it's much more well-defined and benign. It, if we had done a T1-weighted scan, I think we would have settled this as a bright on T1-weighted image. So the correct answer here was indeed a hemangioma, a very common spinal lesion. But let me ask the follow-up question. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so at the boards, the majority of the cases will just, just be cases on imaging and then diagnosis. But there are follow-up questions on a minority of the cases. So with regard to the, the term hemangioma, is that the right term for this lesion? Yes, it's a spinal hemangioma. No, we should be using the term cavernous malformation. No, we should be using the term venous vascular malformation. No, we should be using the term venolymphatic malformation. Or no, we should be using the term barracks. Is hemangioma the correct term for this lesion? This is the terminology of the of the case. So um, we've hit our hundred. Let's share results. So choice number three. It's actually true. You know, we all use the term hemangioma of the spine, but we should know that this is not in our you know uh, classification. It is not a neoplasm, and you know, the, the hemangiomas with the Mulliken classification are supposed to be GLUT1 positive. These lesions are not GLUT1 positives and they're not related to the infantile hemangiomas, for example. These are capillary or venous vascular malformations. They're not at truly neoplasms, despite the fact that they're usually classified as such. And we use the term hemangioma. So there has been a movement to change our terminology on these lesions, but the common vernacular is just to call them hemangiomas. And as you probably know, one of the, the differential diagnosis often is um, just fatty infiltration of the, of the vertebral body. And, you know, when you see enhancement on a post-GAD fat sat scan, it kind of cinches the diagnosis of a venous vascular malformation, AKA hemangioma of bone. All right. Did I share? Okay, stop sharing. All right, we're moving on to case 105. Let me relaunch the poll. Okay, case 105. So we're looking in the cervical spine. I've got a T1 post GAD. This is the same as the T1 post GAD. I just magnified it for you. And Let's see what the question is. All right, this, this patient has prostate cancer. 
what's the best diagnosis in this patient with prostate cancer? Is this a prostate metastasis? Is this a hemangioblastoma? Is it an ependymoma? Is it an astrocytoma? Or most likely a multiple sclerosis plaque? So which do you think is, um, in this patient who has prostate cancer, what's the most likely diagnosis? Prostate metastasis, hemangioblastoma, ependymoma, astrocytoma, or an MS plaque? All right, we've we got 333 participants and we're doing pretty well with getting over 100 uh, results. And uh, choice number three was ependymoma. And that is reasonable, but incorrect. <laughs> so this is in fact a hemangioblastoma. And why is it a hemangioblastoma rather than an ependymoma? I have to say that it certainly looks like it's a cyst with a nodule here. If we, if we go back to the previous and look at the magnified view here, you have the cystic portion as well as the nodule portion. When it's this small and cyst and nodule, I'm much more likely to call this a hemangioblastoma. When it's a larger lesion, more extensive with larger area of enhancement, then I would be more likely to call it an ependymoma. So if it's under one vertebral body segment, I think you should really go with hemangioblastoma, even though it is true that hemangioblastomas are less common lesions than ependymoma. Um, and astrocytomas also can have solid enhancement. We just don't look for it to be quite as small and quite as well-defined as with hemangioblastoma and uh, the occasional ependymoma. So which of these five items, well, let me stop sharing here. Which of these five items does not fit with the other ones, okay? One of these doesn't fit with the other. Is that hemangioblastoma, renal cell carcinoma, pancreatic cysts, endolymphatic sac tumors, or adenoma sebaceum, which one of these doesn't fit with the other um, items? So, um, hemangioblastoma, renal cell carcinoma, pancreatic endolymphatic sac tumors, or adenoma sebaceum. Okay, so this one uh, y'all did pretty uh, well with. It is indeed choice number five. The Numbers one, two, three, and four are all, are all associated with von Hippel-Lindau disease, right? So you remember that von Hippel-Lindau disease is an autosomal dominant uh, disorder with the VHL gene, which is on chromosome three. You have associated with them brain and spinal hemangioblastomas. Within the retina, you may have hemangioblastomas or, or angiomatous lesions as well. They may cause retinal detachment, for example. In the abdomen, I don't usually talk about, but you may have your pancreatic cysts or um, tumors. In uh, clearly, you have your renal cell carcinomas and your kidney cysts associated with von Hippel Lindau disease. Um, endolymphatic sac tumors. So, endolymphatic sac tumors, about 10 to 15% of patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease will have an endolymphatic sac tumors. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the, this, these are tumors in the temporal bone, usually along the plane of the petrous portion of the bone, even though it's um, more in the mastoid portion. And they are unique in that on pre-contrast T1-weighted images, they are bright on the pre-contrast T1-weighted scan, a very uh, fluffy lytic lesion. They do enhance um, and they infect, obviously, the vestibular aqueduct or endolymphatic sac. Um, you should also remember that uh, von Hippel-Lindau disease is also associated with pheochromocytomas and other cyst adenomas. Um, the criteria for making the diagnosis is if you have a family history of von Hippel-Lindau and one of these tumors that I've mentioned, uh, that's sufficient but if you ha don't have the family history, but you have two or more of these type of lesions, then um, you can make the diagnosis of von Hippel-Lindau disease. So I have another question about von Hippel-Lindau disease. Let me stop sharing. Again, a follow-up question, which 
um, probably about 20% of the cases that the boards will have follow-up questions to just the diagnosis. So, which is not true. Patients with von Hippel endowed uh, have a 25 to 35% chance of having a spinal hemangioblastoma. Patients with a spinal hemangioblastoma have a 25 to 35% chance of having von Hippel Lindau. Number three, 25 to 35% of cases of von Hippel Lindau occur sporadically. Number four, all of the above are not true. Or five, none of the above, which means that all of them are true. Okay, so tricky wording, be careful. Um, <laughs> I'll let you think about that, but which is not true. Patients with von Hippel-Lindau have a 25 to 35% chance of a spinal hemangioblastoma. If you have a spinal hemangioblastoma, you have a 25 to 35% chance of having von Hippel-Lindau. 25 to 35% of cases of von Hippel-Lindau occur sporadically as opposed to through the genetic autosomal dominant route. Uh, all of those are wrong for number four or one, two, and three are all correct. And therefore the correct answer is none of the above. All right. Now I see whether I completely confused everybody. I did indeed. So uh, answer number one is correct. We usually say the one third rule of von Hippel-Lindau and spinal hemangioblastoma. So that is that one third of VHL patients have a spinal hemangioblastoma and one third of patients who present with a spinal hemangioblastoma end up having the diagnosis of von Hippel-Lindau disease. Answer number three is actually incorrect. Only 20% of cases of von Hippel-Lindau occur sporadically. Most of these are genetic. 80% occur through that VHL chromosome three gene. So the correct answer of something that's not true is number three. It's only 20% of cases of von Hippel-Lindau occur sporadically. All right. Case number 106. So every once in a while, they'll put in a case that's not perfectly obvious visually and try to see whether you can make the diagnosis. This is what we call an eye case. What is the mechanism of injury for this lesion? And we're not identifying the lesion yet. <laughs> is it acceleration, deceleration injury? Is it a high energy rotation injury? Oh, I guess. Read poll. Sorry. Okay, what is the mechanism of the injury for this lesion? Is it acceleration, deceleration injury? Is it high energy rotation? Is it high energy axial compression? Is it hanging or is it an assault? So for this lesion that is depicted and I'm not pointing out for you, what, what is the mechanism of the injury for the lesion? So this is not a diagnosis question. It's a mechanism question. Is it acceleration, deceleration injury? Is it high energy rotation injury? Is it high energy axial compression? Is it a hanging injury? Or is it status post assault? So lots of people putting in their answers as if they know something is correct. And um, the correct answer here is number three, high energy axial compression. This is an occipital condyle avulsion injury. Let me see what I previous. Oh, I only had one image. So this is the lesion here from the occipital condyle. I have to admit that um, in the 25 years of doing neuroradiology, uh, twice the resident on call picked up the occipital condyle injury on the spinal CT. And I was like, oh man, I missed it. <laughs> so good for the residents for looking at this. And this is something that you will see with motor vehicle collisions as well as falls. And it is considered a high energy axial compression injury. It's not rotation and it's not a back and forth injury and it doesn't occur with hanging or, or assault. Um, there is a classification. And I think that um, asking a question about the type of occipital condyle lesion might be something that could be asked in the neuroradiology subspecialty certification test, but it would be, I think, punitive for the residents um, taking the diagnostic radiology boards. But nonetheless, here are the different types by the Anderson Montesano classification. Type one is comminuted impaction fracture, which you see the comminution here. Type two is associated with other skull base fractures and or a linear fracture. And then what we saw was type three. Here it's avulsed off of 
the um, off of the occipital condyle, and it may or may not be uh, displaced. So an avulsion fracture with tension from the alar ligament is uh, one of the mechanisms here. Okay, we're moving ahead. Case number 107, right on target here with where I want to be. Okay, so you're seeing a post-myelogram CT scan. This is with uh, kind of a bone window. The, media, the, the middle image is more of a soft tissue window. And this is a coronal reconstruction through the fecal sac. Case 107. You can see the patient's already been operated on, but that's irrelevant to the case. Um, and poll. Relaunch poll. Okay. Um, these images demonstrate what? A pseudo meningocele, arachnoiditis, scoliosis, root avulsion, or cord atrophy. What are you seeing on these three images? A pseudo meningocele, arachnoiditis, scoliosis, root avulsion, or cord atrophy. What is being demonstrated here? So we've hit our magic number. Uh, indeed, the correct answer is root avulsion. What you see are the normal nerve roots here and here, but if you notice on the right side, we don't have any nerve roots. We've got the anterior and the posterior rootlet here, nothing on the contralateral side, and the cord looks a little funny here. This is a not such a great coronal reconstruction, but here we have a nerve root, and here we have a nerve root, and here we have a nerve root. On the other side, it's not just that we're not in plane. Those nerve roots have been avulsed. So the correct answer is number four, root avulsion with absence of seeing the nerve roots on the right side, which is the pathologic side. So here's the follow-up question for root avulsion injuries. Clumpy associated with CAT1, which is correct. Clumpy associated with CAT1. Kumpke absent biceps reflex, herb palsy and triceps re reflex, herb palsy and C67 injury, or Dubercy paralysis and C5, C6 injury. Which of these is correct? Kumpke associated with CAT1 injury, Kumpke absent biceps, herbs absent triceps reflex, herbs C6, C7, and Dubercy paralysis and C5, C6, which is the correct. Um, so a little bit slower on uh, answering this one as, as everyone's checking the internet and doing the, <laughs> the Google search for what, <laughs> what is a clumpy paralysis. All right. Well, it looks like it's a little bit slowed down, so I'll share the results. Uh, the most common answer is indeed number one, and it is the correct answer. So Klumke's paralysis is a root avulsion of C8 and T1 nerve roots. It's an injury of those nerve roots at C7, T1, and T1, T2. And as such, it is most commonly associated with intrinsic muscles of the hand weakness. So they talk about the claw hand of Klumke paralysis. This most commonly occurs that we see it with shoulder dystocia around a, um, the birthing process. However, in young adults, we see it most commonly in motorcycle injuries where the motorcyclist goes flying over the handles and reaches out the arms to, as they land. And that kind of yanks the shoulder back and you get root avulsions. So there's two different types. There's the clumpy, um, which is that CAT11. And then you have, and that, that may also be associated with Horner syndrome. So the, the avulsion that's associated with the Horner syndrome is clumpy paralysis. The herb, whoops, the herb Duchenne um, palsy is a C5, C6 palsy 
where you lose the biceps reflex and you have sort of this waving hand um, characteristic. So it's it's not the intrinsic muscles of the hand, but it's, I'm sorry, it's more the, um, um, more the, um, the limp arm rather than the hand. So biceps reflex is lost with, um, with the herb palsy. Okay, Duber C paralysis, I, I made this up. Uh, thank you for the five people who went with that one. <laughs> I just made up some term. Okay, let's move on. So this is case 108. Um, this was a patient who had abrupt onset of quadriparesis. Relaunched the poll here. Sorry about that. So, what is the best diagnosis? Is this most likely to be multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, myelinogenesis glycoprotein disorder (MOG), um, spinal cord stroke, or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, abrupt onset of quadriparesis in the patient? Best diagnosis multiple sclerosis, NMO, neuromyelitis optica, used to be called Devix syndrome, um, MOG disorder against the algodendrocyte protein, stroke, or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. All right, so let's see, share the results here. So the, the most common answer is stroke. You should recognize that this is a diffusion-weighted imaging. How do we know that this is diffusion-weighted imaging? Really bad look at the spine. It's not, you know, the vertebral bodies here don't look anything like a T1 or a T2 or a STIR image. What you're seeing is a sagittal DWI, DTI uh, sequence. And you've got this, these bright areas within the spinal cord. So this is a spinal cord stroke. And the history of abrupt onset should have led you to that. Most of the other things, multiple sclerosis and all the other demyelinating disorders are not um, presenting like that. Um, ADEM is the post-viral or post-vaccination uh, autoimmune demyelinating disorder that can occur in the spine. Those are long segment disease. Remember that we talk about long segment disease when we're talking about NMO. These are little, you know, dots here, which would not go for multiple vertebral body segments of either NMO, SD, or MOG. It could be MS, um, but this is a DWI suggesting that this is ischemic injury. Which is the, let me uh, stop sharing here. Which of these is the least likely etiology of a cord stroke? I'm not necessarily saying the one that I showed you, but of all cord strokes, what's the least likely etiology? Aortic surgery, aortic dissection, genetic causes, vasculitis, or trauma? Which of the five of these is the least likely source of a cord stroke? Is it aortic surgery? Is it aortic dissection? Is it genetic? causes? Is it vasculitis or would it be trauma? So what? Okay. So a vast majority of you got the correct answer of genetic causes. Aortic surgery, unfortunately, is the most common of the iatrogenic etiologies for cord stroke. It doesn't happen very often, thank goodness. But remember that we do have that supply of the uh, artery of Adam Kavitz, which is the most common source of the stroke. This one up top in the cervical spine, very uncommon. You can see that with vertebral artery dissections occasionally um, and sometimes surgery, but the vast majority of these are really in the thoracolumbar junction and they're secondary to either aortic surgery or aortic dissection or aortic coarct or aortic aneurysms that they're operating on. And unfortunately they pick off one of the supplies of the um, artery of Adam Kavitz uh, through the intercostal arteries, for example. 
genetic causes, I'm not really sure where I came up with that. Uh, um, you know, theoretically, Marfan syndrome, I guess, but that's the least common. Vasculitis is a common cause. And in fact, this patient that had that cervical spine actually had lupus and a mixed connective tissue disorder and had the lupus um, antibody, the, the lupus anticoagulant factors, and that was presumed to be the source of the patient's cervical spine stroke. And as you would imagine, it's very devastating. This was a 26-year-old, I believe. Trauma occasionally will, will occur if you have an aortic um, transection, for example. But genetic causes was the correct answer. Let's move on to case 109. Stop sharing here. Stop sharing. Okay. Okay, so we are on case 109. This patient had left-sided back pain. You're seeing a, sad, a coronal reconstruction of the axial scan. Here's a, one of the axial scans. You're seeing a sagittal reconstruction through the sacrum. And this is an axial scan with soft tissue window as opposed to the bone window. Case 109. Best diagnosis for this lesion, is it spondylolysis? Is it spondylolisthesis? Is it Bastrop's disease? Is it Bertolotti syndrome? Or none of the above? Best diagnosis here. Spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, Bastrop's disease, Bertolotti syndrome, or none of the above? All right, you guys are hitting home runs these days. Okay. So the correct answer was indeed number four, Bertolotti syndrome. Bertolotti syndrome is a syndrome in which one or both of the transverse processes of L5 articulates with the sacrum. And via this uh, unusual articulation, you have abnormal spinal mobility, and that can lead to either unilateral, bilateral, or midline low back pain. And um, this, uh, believe it or not, there is a gene that predisposes you to Bertolotti syndrome. It's called the Hox10 gene, uh, strange thing. But um, we we walk by this quite a few, quite a bit. And you know, this is the best diagnosis in a outpatient setting of a patient who has a low back pain. You get the CT scan or MRI of the of the lumbar spine. First off, on the MRI, it's going to be very hard to pick this up. Um, on the CT, this is what you're looking at, this communication between the transverse process of L5 with the sacrum. And, uh, you know, I suspect that we walk by this quite a bit in our, in our practice. Um, on, in the emergency room, for those residents taking ER call, you want to make sure you don't call this a fracture. You can see that the edges are actually quite um, bright and this is a congenital deformity rather than an acute traumatic deformity. Okay, we're moving on to case 110. Stop sharing. Oh. All right, case 110, we have a sagittal T2-weighted image. It doesn't look like it's stirred because the fat is still preserved. Here's an axial T2-weighted scan. which does not fit with this case. B12, copper, folate, nitrous oxide, or none of the above, they all fit, which does not, let me go back just to show the axial scan one more time. So here's case 110, sagittal and axial. Which of these does not fit? Is it B12? Is it copper? Is it folate? Is it nitrous oxide? Or none of the above, the preceding four options all fit together. So, all right. Almost evenly split. I stumped quite a few of you on this one. <laughs> so this is, um, let's just go back to the previous image. This is a pretty classic for subacute combined degeneration in which you have the high signal intensity in the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. And you notice the two posterior columns here, 
And there's often a little spared portion right in the midline of the rafe there, but these are indeed in the posterior columns bilaterally of the spinal cord. So we have, the diagnosis is subacute combined degeneration. Now we have to ask what are the various causes of subacute combined degeneration? And the answer is that B12 deficiency, copper deficiency, and folate deficiency all can cause subacute combined degeneration in a pattern just like that. Often the folate is in conjunction with the B12, but before this morning, I checked and said, can folate in and of itself without B12 cause subacute combined degeneration? And I looked online and said, yes, that, that, is, um, that does occur. The other thing that can lead to the pattern of subacute combined degeneration is nitrous oxide overdose. This is um, laughing gas. And when, when, when I was young, many years ago, uh, we used to have these things called little whippets. And it was like a little canister sized laughing gas that you could get, you know, illicitly <laughs> and uh, have a good time in, at the party. So um, nitrous oxide overdose or use uh, whippets as we called them, these are the things that can cause subacute combined degeneration. This pattern of, of posterior involvement of the spinal cord uh, can also be seen in demyelinating disorders such as your NMOSD. It's a little bit too long for us to be thinking in terms of multiple sclerosis because of this um, you know, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis appearance. The other thing is uh, vacuolar myelopathy, which has in, in recent years been most commonly associated with HIV infection. Um, so there is a differential diagnosis, but when you see this, you know, two little bright stuff right in the posterior columns of the spinal cord, that's, you know, we're going to certainly raise these issues in the report. So that way the clinicians check, check those values and supplement. Um, this is um, in particular um, because the number of vegetarian and vegan Americans has been rising, not rapidly enough, according to my wife, who's a strict vegan, but it has been rising. And therefore B12 deficiency is something that can be a, um, a complicate or not a complication, but something that vegans and vegetarians have to be careful about. Okay. Stop sharing this. This is case 111. Um, you're looking at a sagittal T, uh, T2 uh, cis image, uh, high resolution cis image. Which does the patient have? Chiari 1, syringohydromyelia, achondroplasia, hydrocephalus, or all of the above? W which does the patient have? Chiari 1, Syringohydromyelia, achondroplasia, hydrocephalus, or all of the all of the above. Okay, so I mean, most of you would recognize the the syrinx here, the 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 syringohydromyelia. We use the term syringohydromyelia because purists will say that hydromyelia is just central canal dilatation, whereas a syrinx is not in the central canal, but peripheral to it, a lot of times we can't tell the difference. You might also look at the ballooning out of the third ventricle, and we've lost our infundibular recesses of the third ventricle. We got a big lateral ventricle. So we have hydrocephalus and we have syringohydromyelia. So you got to go with all of the above. If, if we look at the size of the frame and magnum here, it is small. And so that will go along with a chondroplasia. You might, if I had shown the head size, you might have figured that out as well. And um, eh, on the um, on the Chiari one, uh, that's a little soft. So I might want to change this question. Uh, this patient actually had, in addition, aqueductal stenosis. So the correct answer here, and I'll share the result, um, was indeed choice number five. All of the above although soft on the Chiari 1, we want to, you know, when we draw that line from the epistolon to the basion, uh, we want to see 
tonsillar herniation more than five millimeters. I'm not sure what would have gotten there. Let's move on to case 112. Okay, case uh, 112 is a trauma case and it's a craniocervical junction trauma case. Which ligament, let me, I already got answers coming out. Let me, let me re, re poll because I didn't even show the uh, question yet. Okay, which uh, ligament is injured in this patient? who had craniocervical junction trauma? Is it the tectorial ligament? Is it the anterior longitudinal ligament? Is it the posterior longitudinal ligament? Is it the lano-occipital ligament or membrane? Or is it the apical ligament? This is a t 2 weighted scan in a patient with craniocervical junction trauma. Which ligament is demonstrated to be injured? Is that the tectorial membrane or ligament? Is it the anterior longitudinal ligament? Is it posterior longitudinal ligament? Is it the lano-occipital ligament or membrane? Or is it the apical ligament? All right, so people are having a little bit of difficulty on this one. All right, well, um, I would recommend that for those of you who are about to take call uh, in the emergency room that you might wanna relook over the anatomy here. So the most common answer was choice number four, which is the correct answer, but we only got 29% uh, correct response rate. Um, the lano-occipital membrane or ligament is that extension of the anterior longitudinal ligament where it comes to the skull base and the C1, C2 level. So that's the area where we have our injury. I, I put up a diagram here. So remember that the tectorial membrane is this guy right here, and that's the extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, but up here, this bright area here represents the anterior lano-occipital membrane. And that is, again, the extension of the anterior longitudinal ligament, which we usually say ends at the C1, C2 kind of junction there. You have the transverse ligament behind the C1, C2. So back here would be our transverse ligament. So what is the... Uh, let me stop sharing and ask the next question. Name the extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament to the clivus. Is that the tegmental ligament? Is that the tectorial membrane? Is that the apical ligament? Is that the cruciate ligament? Or is that the posterior longitudinal membrane? What is the term for the extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament as it connects to the clivus? Is that the tegmental ligament, tectorial membrane, the apical ligament, the cruciate ligament, or the posterior longitudinal membrane? So this is what I call for the residents, your five minute recall question. <laughs> Since I just mentioned that to you all. Okay, so here again, the tectorial, this arrow should be right here. This tectorial membrane is the extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament. So here's posterior longitudinal ligament. And then this is the tectorial membrane going to the, this is our clivus. We're a little bit flipped in our usual um, orientation. The apical ligament is this guy right here, which goes from the top or the apex of the odontoid process to the clivus. That's the apical ligament. And then remember that the anterior lanto-occipital membrane is the extension of the anterior longitudinal ligament up to the clivus. So case 117, we're going to stick with this theme just to push you on it. Let me launch the poll here. So here's another trauma case, another injury case, craniocervical injury. Which is the non-injured ligament? Is it the tectorial membrane? Is it the anterior longitudinal um, ligament? Is it the apical ligament? Is it the lano-occipital membrane? Or none of the above, all of them are injured. So which of these is not injured? Would that be the tectorial membrane? Would it be the anterior longitudinal ligament? Would it be the apical ligament, the lano-occipital membrane, or none of the above? They're all injured. All right, so if you look here, the there's this displacement and the ligament that should be going from the top of the odontoid process to the clivus, which is the apical ligament, is involved, right? 
the anterior longitudinal ligament is all this stuff here with the bright stuff. And then it, this, there should be a ligament connecting from here to here at the C1, C2 junction. This is all bright. So this nano-occipital membrane, and I would argue that this goes down further. You can see this darker signal here of the anterior longitudinal ligament where it was intact. So this is involved, this is involved, and this is involved. The next question is, is the tectorial membrane involved? So here's the tectorial membrane going, as I said, the extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament to the um, clivus. And I would say this is intact. So the correct answer should be number one. Uh, we'd want to see it on multiple views. You, you know, you want, you know, some people might say, well, what about right at the attachment of the clivus? Questionable, but usually if it's going to tear, it's like along this portion, not at its junction with the clivus. So correct answer was tectorial membrane. All right, case 114. We're still rocking and rolling here. Oh, I forgot to share the result. Um, let me relaunch. Okay, so we have case um, 114. And um, this is a gradient echo scan and T2-weighted scan. T1, not much seen there. T2, the region is here on the sagittal. Given everything, one, two, three, and this, what's the best diagnosis? Would this be an ependymoma, a multiple sclerosis, post-traumatic myelomalacia, a cavernoma, or none of the above? Given everything, what do you think this most likely represents? Is this going to be an ependymoma, an MS plaque, post-traumatic myelomalacia, a cavernoma, or none of the above? Woohoo! Knocked it out of the park. Good job. So this little dot of darkness here in the spinal cord is indeed a little focus of hemosiderin in the spinal cord. You notice that the cord is not expanded, so this not going to be an ependymoma. It's negative on T1. Here, it, it actually has a rim of dark signal around it on the T2-weighted sagittal scan, which is typical of uh, cavernoma with the bright signal intensity, uh, the, the dark signal intensity of the hemosiderin around the periphery of it. So this is not an acute injury. You don't see any edema in the spinal cord. This is an old injury with hemosiderin deposition in a cavernoma. Okay. All right, next case, case 115. T2, T1, post-GAD, T1, all these sagittal plane. Case 115. Best category of disease. This is most likely neoplastic, degenerative, metabolic, infectious, or iatrogenic, something that we did as physicians. What is the best category of the disease? You think this is neoplastic, degenerative, metabolic, infectious, or something one of the doctors did? All right. So um, choice number four, overwhelmingly, this is indeed discitis and osteomyelitis. And you also see this extra dural enhancing tissue. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call this an epidural abscess. I still like to see some central necrosis to cause something an abscess. I'm more likely to use the term phlegmon for this uh, enhancing tissue that is associated with the infection. So uh, you got enhancement in the disc. You've got abnormal signal in the disc. The end plates are all eroded. T1, dark and signal intensity. So infectious, discitis, osteomyelitis, complex. So it is uh, 1255 on with me. So I'm going to stop the share and start um, in, there's some chat questions. I'll try to get to the chat questions and I'll go to Q&A. So uh, would the size of the sequestration point to an acute or chronic process? I don't think the size helps at all with making that uh, differentiation for a sequestration. They can be small, they can be large, but what you do see is a tend to be a peripheral rim of enhancement. 
on chat. Can you mention injuries expected with other mechanisms, please? I think this is this, what we were, uh, when we was talking about the um, occipital condyle fracture. So the rotational injuries, you can have rotatory subluxation at the C1, C2 junction. I'm specifically talking about that. Obviously, we know the uh, mechanism for the hangman's fracture with the um, pedicle fracture of C2. And you have um, the Jefferson fracture of C1, where it's kind of a burst fracture. So there are different mechanisms specifically for what we usually talk about, craniocervical junction uh, injuries. Can degenerative changes mimic a type 1 occipital fracture? Um, type 1 is, um, is comminuted. I don't, I don't think um, that, that's not where you usually have degenerative change that you would have little ossicles, for example. Question 106, not sure what that's about. Hyperacute MS plaques can show a restricted diffusion. Um, I would agree in the brain. Um, we don't have, I think, enough experience in the spinal cord to be able to say that they're restricted. They're usually so small and DWI is so... Um, is is so low resolution that I don't I haven't seen literature about um, spinal MS plaques showing restricted diffusion. I would still be very worried about a cord infarct. Five one two five four. Thank you for that. I don't know what that means. Thank you for attending. Very good. Thank you for your time. Okay, looks like that's um, again. Uh, let me go to the Q and A. Can you address ectopic? gas in the spinal canal. So ectopic gas in the spinal canal usually means obviously vacuum phenomena. It can occur in the intervertebral disc, but it can also occur in the facet joints. And therefore you might see it laterally. You may see it um, centrally. Um, it is an indicator of uh, degenerative change. Not only that, but what there's a statement that people make, and that is you should not see vacuum cleft phenomenon in fused spines because it shouldn't be moving and, it, and trapping nitrogen. So if you see ectopic gas in a spinal fusion case, it usually means that the spinal fusion has not taken in and it's not truly fused. Um, can you please tell me in detail about gradient coils used in MRI skin? That's a little uh, bit removed from what um, from what um, I wanted to talk about, but you know, the, there are a lot of we we tend to use small coils in tandem in order to maximize signal to noise, and yet have enough coverage to be able to cover the cervical thoracic region. For example, in an MS case, usually we're doing it with uh, like thirty centimeters, twenty four to thirty centimeters field of view. And you have to have a lot of parallel coils used for, for the spine. This fits right in with USMLE. I thank you very much. I hope so. How, how, how may you make a difference between apical ligament injury and a lano-occipital one behind the one behind the other? So the lano-occipital membrane is anterior to the apical ligament. The apical ligament, you would see at the top of the uh, odontoid process going to the clivus, as you saw in the diagram. The atlanto-occipital one, follow the anterior longitudinal ligament. It, it's, it's anterior to apical ligament. Thanks so much, Greg. Do you put in your report the potential for spontaneous regression of the disc extrusion? So um, with respect to the sequestrated disc, over the course of time, they do um, a resolve. And in fact, the presence of that enhancement around that sequestrated fragment is a good sign because it means granulation tissue is growing in and it can resolve. Basically, it doesn't matter what we're showing on the imaging. What's the patient's symptoms? Is it referable to that uh, disc herniation? I've seen horrible disc herniations in patients who are symptomatic at a different level and a different side. Can you get degenerative gas in a vertebral body? When you get degenerative gas in a vertebral body, you worry about Kussmaul's uh, syndrome, which is... Uh, potentially from a vascular necrosis of the vertebral body. However, the most common source of gas in a vertebral body is from the disc going up. But if you don't have degenerative change and you have the disc, the gas in the center of the vertebral body, consider caissons disease, sickle cell disease, a vascular necrosis of the vertebral body. What do you think about resorption of herniated disc? What is the criteria for full resorption? Mm, I'll pass on that one. I don't know what you mean by full resorption, but Obviously, if you don't see it, 
um, that, I guess that means resorption. Uh, can you explain in the last case why it is not a metastasis? So the last case is centered on the disk. It has high signal intensity in the disk. It has enhancement in the disk. That's not a site where we usually see metastases. And it had the epidural phlegmon, which is unlikely to be with a um, metastasis. Um, most metastases are to the bones. They're not to the spinal cord and they're not to the epidural space. All right, I think, well, I did pretty well with answering all those questions. Let me see. Can you please describe the traumatic injuries in rheumatoid arthritis regarding craniocervical junction? So um, not so much the trauma, but clearly the transverse ligament um, becomes lax. You have that possibility of lanoaxial uh, subluxation greater than three to five millimeters at the C1, C2 junction. And um, it's more of an inflammatory process rather than a traumatic injury. Does it predispose you to having some laxity at C1, C2? It does, um, but that combination of trauma and RA is not as much. Thank you, Dave. What is the incidence of solitary spinal hemangioblastoma in VHL without intracranial lesions? So it wouldn't be VHL if it's only a solitary sp spinal hemangioblastoma without a family member. So that's what makes the VHL is the family history with a single hemangioblastoma. As it were, I would say it's probably less than 5% will present as just spinal hemangioblastoma and family member with von Hippolindo. That's pretty uncommon. All right. I think that's all the <laughs> Dr. questions. Yusum, I, mean, I, I commend you. Uh, 15 cases, 15 questions. That was, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for leading us through this case review. Uh, and thanks for everybody for participating in this noon conference. You can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. Be sure to join us next week on Thursday, April 6th at 12 p.m. Eastern. We're featuring Dr. Leah Ali Holly for a lecture entitled MR Neurography of the Cranial Spinal Nerves Below the Skull Base. You can register for this free lecture at MRI Online and follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Thanks again and have a great day. Don't forget the quiz bank. <laughs>